Welcome to another episode of Comedy Wham Presents with me, your host, Valerie, coming to you from the 2022 Just for Laughs Moon Tower Comedy Festival. My sometime co-host, Ms. Purrington, is resting at home. ComedyWham.com is your place to go for features about all Austin comedy. You can keep up with us on Twitter and Instagram at Comedy Wham or on our Comedy Wham Facebook page. In addition to podcasts, Comedy Wham brings you articles, album reviews, and our new column, Rochelle Takes on Comedy. Have you checked out our events page for live shows in Austin, Houston, and DFW? If you're a comic in those cities and want your show featured on the calendar, go to the events page and click Submit a Show to complete the survey. If you like the survey and like our events page, send us a quick review and we'll share your review and promo your show on Instagram. Now let's get back to our podcast. With over 200 interviews since its launch in 2016, the podcast is your anthropology lesson in Austin comedy, bringing you funny people and their stories. As a fan, I like to delve into a comic's background and motivations, and will usually take a detour along the way. Consider the interview a way for you to get to know the folks that make the comedy world as fascinating off stage as it is on stage. If you like our podcast, please rate and review us. Today we're recording live on location at the Driscoll Hotel. Uh, thank you very much for Omnipop for helping us arrange this interview. And uh, I think, I have to fact check this with all my past interviews, I think this may be the first lawyer that we've ever had on our podcast. Uh, his first comedic writing job was for Unscrewed with Martin Sargent, and he would subsequently get hired for many, many more writing jobs. Uh, he was a writer and performer on the hit show Chelsea Lately. You may have heard of him as the host of the podcast Pop Rocket, which covered pop culture. He's got a Joan River story or two to share, I'm sure, after being part of the writing team of Fashion Police. Uh, he's also been a writer for The Mindy Kaling Project, one of my favorite shows. His debut album, Effable, was released in 2015, and actually in 2018 he wrote a book where Mindy Kaling wrote the foreword, and the book is called My Life as a Goddess, a Memoir Through Unpopular Culture. He's back at Moon Tower, and in addition to performing stand-up, he's going to be talking about his writing projects in collaboration with the Austin Film Festival, and he's performing as one of Sarah Silverman's friends at her show this weekend. And now Comedy Wham presents our guest, Guy Branham. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. Um, first off, do you know anything about IRC Section 412? Um, the Internal <laughs> Revenue Code? Yes. Um, I, I don't know what Section 412 is. <laughs> it's a pension funding law, a oh. section of the code. I assume that when you were a lawyer, you did you were not doing pension law. No, I was not doing <laughs> pension law. I took one tax class, uh, and the only thing I remember from it is a guy bought a piano and it had a um, thousand uh, dollars hidden inside of it and they had to figure out whether uh, the thousand dollars was an increase in value of the piano that he bought or if it was just a windfall like if you found a uh, thousand uh, dollars uh. and the answer was it was a windfall uh. that's what I know about taxes <laughs> so if anybody ever buys a piano with a thousand dollars hidden inside you know the law there you go. Oh, well, you've had such a fascinating uh, life well, history. Well, no, before we go any further, yes. are you on the wrong side of IRC 412? Like, did you do something with your pension fund? <laughs> do we need to get you real counsel? Uh, I should hope not. I am an actuary. Okay, okay. So I hope to be on the right side of, and then, you know, I'm sure this is not something you care about, but 412 was repealed with the Pension Protection Act and is now... Section 430. Okay. So we've now put everybody to sleep. This. Yes. <laughs> so I just had to get that, you know, little trivia out of the way. Uh, <laughs> with you. Thank you for indulging me. <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? Guy says to himself. <laughs> All right, let's dig into your, your comedy career, which yes. has been um, very extensive. Mm. And I want to know, as I'm sure many people want to know, since you did go to law school, past the bar, why and what got you away from it and into comedy? Well, there are a lot of former lawyers who have ended up being comedians. Like Dimitri Martin started law school. Um, uh, Greg Giraldo was uh, a former attorney. Um, and I think it is, you know, like the, for me law school was like a safe path that my parents were mm. my mom kept urging me to do and so I did it and part of 
like coming out of the closet and accepting that I wanted to lead a life that was my own was like saying, no, I don't want to do this. I want to be a stand-up. But I also think stand-up comedy and the law are very similar. They draw similar people, aggressive people who like to be coercive with language. Um, and I think they do... I definitely am able to apply a f some few of my skills from law school. Just when it comes from, like, just being able to take a piece of writing and pull as many words out of it as possible is something that's very useful as a television writer, but even more useful as a stand-up comic on stage. Yeah. Like, any fat you can cut out of a joke makes it stronger. And, you know, legal writing is all about making things as, like, clear as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes... Perfect, perfect sense. Yeah. So your first, oh, actually, I have remembered my official icebreaker question now yes. that we have broken the ice. Yes. Is pick one word to describe your past. Oh, um, florid. That's a first. Awesome. Do you care to elaborate on oh, why I mean, that one came to mind? The thing is, is like, my past is long and it's complex, but I think I have attempted to like, I don't know make it fun and flowery as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, um, while it's been boring in its way, it's full of, you know, the Joan River stories you were mentioning and all sorts of other dumb, stupid choices I made that at least <laughs> made it more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So was your first um, foothold into comedy as a stand-up versus as jumping into the writing aspect? Yeah, so I knew I kind of wanted to be a writer, but I didn't ha feel like I could believe in myself long enough to write a spec script or a screenplay or something like that. And stand-up, you know, you only have to believe in yourself for, like, the length of an like, outgoing message. Like, you just have to... 45 seconds for a joke, and if you put enough of those together, you can do it. And I also was somebody who needed... Like... To be able to write something long, you have to believe in yourself along the way. Like, with fits and starts, you don't have to believe in yourself consistency. But, like, I would get to such levels of uncertainty, and going and performing reminded me of the stuff that worked and told me the stuff that didn't work, and it was really so important. And in the process, I just fell in love with stand-up. And I, um, I did stand-up for, like, two years, and then I got my first writing job for a little cable network, and then, you know, writing paid the bills mostly for a decent chunk of my life. But then stand-up, you know, there have also been times in my life when stand-up was paying the bills. Mm -hmm. Where did you start stand-up? I started stand-up in San Francisco. Okay. So I went to law school in Minnesota, but I had been an undergrad at Berkeley. And so I moved back to the Bay Area, and I lived in Oakland. And the San Francisco comedy community was, like, really lovely. It was, like, a great merger of sort of, like alt comedy and club comedy like it was a place mm -hmm. where we all went to the punchline we all performed for like club audiences but then there was also this rich world of alt comedy and like audiences that wouldn't take the cheapest possible joke from you and then it was also one of I mean the only place in America other than New York at that point in time where you had sort of a semi-flourishing queer comedy community and I I didn't start out understanding that gayness was going to be an impediment to mainstream success in stand-up. Mm. It was only after I got to L.A. that I sort of realized, oh, you know, things are a little bit different. But, uh, like, San Francisco really gave me a, a wonderful place to start and I think is, um, you know, as, has been the birthplace of a, a lot of really great comics who I love and respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. And then how long were you in San Francisco before... I started you... comedy in 2002, I believe, and then in 2004. Um, so it, at the beginning of 2004, I got a job for a cable network in San Francisco, and then they got bought by Comcast, and I got fired and then rehired and told that I had to move to L.A., and I was like, sure. And so I moved in August of 2004. So that's a long time ago now, 18 yeah. years almost. Um, but it does mean that I've spent most of my career as an L.A. comic and now try to talk as much like a jaded L.A. comic as possible, <laughs> you know? Breezy, full of entitlements, like, 
when I was in San Francisco, we hated LA comics because every shitty LA comic had so many good TV credits that they could just roll up and the club treated them like they were gods. Yeah. And now, like, that's what I tell young people in Los Angeles is like, stop complaining. Like, people from Denver would kill for your TV credits. <laughs> In, in the 18 years that you've been doing stand-up, uh, where... Because uh, I, I kind of want to want to talk about that queer comedy scene and how L.A. has changed, because we've had some amazing com- comics move from Austin to L.A., and I feel like they've pushed themselves into the queer and gay comedy scene that exists in L.A. I mean, do, do you find that LA is now like has stepped up its game? I mean everywhere has stepped up their game. Like uh, LA has gotten so much better um, just in in so many ways. I think the presence of women um, on lineups is something that shifted. When I started comedy like it was normal to have one woman on a lineup and if there was a woman Mm -hmm. on a lineup and a lot of it has been conversation and a lot of it has just been cultural shift but we've moved to a place where People are, you know, a comedy community is starting to maybe more treat women like they are equals in human beings. Like, when I started comedy, I was never on a show with a queer person unless it was an all-queer comedy show. Mm. And I remember the day in, like, 2012 or 2013 that I, for the first time, was booked on a show and there were three gay comics on it and, like, it just hadn't crossed anybody's mind. Mm -hmm. But I also think... Like, it is wonderful to have queer spaces for comedy because for such a long time, queer people... I, I remember being at UCB East, not that long ago, 2015 probably, and it was a show where, like, there were there was a clutch of gay guys in the audience, and I clocked them, and then it was a show where every guy who got on stage said the word faggot. And it was just sort of this reminder of, like, oh, you're letting these people know that... You, that their presence is conditional that like they have to if they want to be here and enjoy the show they also have to be humiliated a little bit and I think that it's taking time for queer audiences to understand that comedy that isn't drag that isn't explicitly queer comedy can be for them and as somebody who you know but it's changing and it's wonderful to see that changing it's wonderful to see um, the audiences at Brooklyn shows you know here like we have uh, Pat Regan and Kat Cohen at the festival who are like so grew out of this Brooklyn comedy scene that was all about like um, women and queer people and was creative and you know defies a lot of the rules and logic of conventional stand up and you know uh, LA is more of a New York can be a cabaret town but LA is more <laughs> of a straight stand up town but we still have so many great comics with so many different voices and you know, I, I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's nice. We just got here in Austin our first uh, queer open mic. Uh huh. And that was, you know, yeah. here, 2022. And we, I, I'd like to think that we've been supportive, but, you know, it's only now happening. Well, one of the things about stand up that I love is that inherent in it is a lot of adversity. Like, stand up audiences are more hostile to the performer than just about any other performance Mm. style. And it's kind of what makes stand-up good. And it's very hard because you both... Stand-up has to be hard for you to get good at it. But there is also just sort of like institutional hardness that exists for women and people of color and for queer people Mm -hmm. um, that not everybody should have to slog through. And something like a queer open mic is a great place to fail on your own merits, Mm. you know? (laughs) Um, And like, it's been really cool when I have gone to shows like, uh, in in Seattle or Portland, I think I went to a queer open mic, and it was just so fun to see what people were exploring and what they were playing with. Yeah, yeah. Yay, keep keep up the good work, everyone. Yeah. We need more, (laughs) we need more. Okay, so, I'm gonna pivot to Uh something else, but now focusing more on you. Yes. You started in 20, 2002. Yes. I'm and very old. <laughs> but young in heart. Yes. No, I'm very old at heart. <laughs> I've always been middle-aged in my soul. <laughs> 13 years into your career, you decided to release an album. Uh-huh. What got you to that moment? Especially since you've been very busy with writing jobs. It wasn't something I thought about as much as... Um, 
other comics I knew who worked primarily in stand-up. I, I hadn't really thought about it, and it really was the festival scene of, like, um, Bridgetown and Moon Tower and High Plains and that sort of thing. Um, well, actually what happened is <laughs> I was working for Chelsea lately, and... Um, I, there came a point where I had some tensions with her about other projects that I had and I decided that the best thing for me to do was to leave the show and Ms. Handler was not happy with that and she put some effort into making it hard for me to work after that Ooh. and so I spent like a year and a half trying to sort of like dig myself out of that hole and figure out what I was doing and in the process in very early 2012 I went to Bridgetown and uh, I had just started a show, uh, a live show called Talk Show the Game Show that I ended up turning into a TV show. Um, and the, like those festivals, Moon Tower and Bridgetown and High Plains and that sort of world helped me remember what I was doing and what direction I was going in. And it also, it, re -expo it exposed me to a generation of comics I hadn't gotten to know because I was mostly in LA. Mm -hmm. And it also exposed me to like people with comedy record labels who were like, guy needs to do an album. And so um, it was just a really nice situation of a couple of years later uh, being like, yeah, why not? Um, and I, it was an album I was really proud of. Yeah. And did you take the philosophy of now I'm retiring this material or it was just, you know, this is my... Look, my I fucking album. leaned on that material for far too long. <laughs> um, after the album, well, what happened was I... The year after that, I recorded a submission for um, a half hour on Comedy Central, and Comedy Central declined to make it a half hour, uh, and that was like a real blow. It mm. like really hurt um, because I I was really proud of that material, and I would have loved to have understood why they didn't think it merited a half hour, and that happened at the same time that our country. Uh, elected a truly terrible man to be president and it left me in a place where I really didn't know what direction to go in and stand up um, luckily I'm now in a hotel bar where <laughs> vacuuming is going on so <laughs> success has found us yes it has um, but uh, like it really was the pandemic that sort of forced me to uh, accept I can't really do those jokes anymore <laughs> Guy, will you promise me you'll turn this into a comedy bit that you were having an interview? I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, you know, there's there's a chance that uh, she's not going to be there long. I'm going to pause. So after we elected Donald Trump, I truly didn't know what I was supposed to be doing or saying as a comedian, and I felt really lost. And, um, you know, just as I was sort of, I mean, I, I don't know. I just feel like I was in the wilderness for like six years. And then I was like, you can't let this be the case anymore. And I was also, I, I was in a relationship for the first time in my life. And um, I was giving, I was still doing stand up. And I was, but I was like, not finding or creating material that lasted mm. um, and so it was only in sort of like the last year that I was like I have to um, I have to get over this hump but I need to start finding material that I love again and figuring out what my perspective is what I need to say and also the relationship broke up and mm. so um, I was just you know sad yeah so what what brought the spark back after that realization? I mean, it's going to stand up. Like, it, it is, we spent two years without having stand up in the way that it um, should exist. Yeah. And it was really nice and lovely when I got to do Zoom shows, but, you know, part of it was just like, it had to happen. It's something I wanted in my life. It's something I wanted to focus on. And it's not like, oh, well, the spark came back magically. It's like, I had to go and find the spark. Mm. But the spark is like, I love watching stand-up comedy. Like, I really love it. Like, some people get annoyed 
at something like this. Some people just like want to be in the green room and don't want to have to watch a bunch of people's sets. But I like watching people's sets. And it also always makes my brain work in stand-up more. Um, and so that's really good. It, like, my therapist kept urging me to watch more specials. And um, I should have, but it's like... Watching somebody's Netflix special is hard because you're like, I envy them. Um, and, and you had your personal heartbreak with, not, you yes. know, not with Netflix, but with... Yeah, with I mean, Central. it was just, it was, and also that was me being too brittle a comedian. Mm. Like, um, I, in a thousand different ways, will tell people, well, like, yes, rejection happens, but also success happens. And so just go do that. And I get kind of mad at myself that I let my pride mm. fuck with me that much. But also, we're stand-up comedians. We're going to let our pride fuck with us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, it and it's like it's hard work. And the, the funny thing is, is that for so much of my life, writing like a screenplay or a spec script felt like hard work, and stand-up was fun. And then we came to this point, like you know, I found myself a couple of months ago. Every time I was trying to write stand-up, I would just end up doing work on some scripted project I had because I felt like there was an endpoint and I knew like that I would be moving towards something where stand-up really requires you to just like open up your mind and your heart and like it means you can truly spend six hours at a cafe and nothing happens mm. or you can spend six hours at a cafe and you find something or you spend six hours at a cafe and nothing happens and then when you're in the shower or driving like the bit just comes to you. You know what I mean? Like, one of the things that's been lovely about being here is, like, the amount of writing that happens on stage. They're just like, oh, I'm angry at this bit because it's not finished. And then you think that you should, like, write it somewhere, like, type it somewhere, like, write it into a notebook. And then you're on stage, and, like, the answer just starts flowing out of you. Yesterday I realized that, like... Writing on stage is crowd working yourself. You know, <laughs> it, it's like, it's playing with the idea that you're saying and messing around with it. Uh -huh. I, I got to catch uh, one of your sets Wednesday night or th whatever, Stars and Bars. Uh -huh. It was the Antones, Packed House. And yeah. you, you comics get to do like a very intense and short seven minute set or mm -hmm. eight or whatever. Um, you must be used to doing much longer sets, so uh, you'll, you could correct me. It felt very much like you're pulling information out of the audience and then running with it. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is I really love crowd work and so frequently will build crowd work into the beginning of one of my uh -huh. bits. And that's not necessarily a good thing because, like, you can't do that on television. And in a seven minute set, it's not great to have a bit that you want to start out by having a conversation with someone. Because <laughs> if the conversation goes in the wrong direction, that can be 10 very funny minutes, but like, I don't have that time in a seven minute set. Yeah. So, you know, it was not professional of me <laughs> to be doing something that involved crowd work. But also, like, all of us here are whining about having to do seven to eight minute <laughs> sets. You know, it's just, you're not used to it. And also, yeah. But as L.A. comics, we should be good at, like, you know, in New York, you have all of these people who are so great at an hour. Uh -huh. And in L.A., whoever does an hour, you know? Um, and so we should be good at our hard, polished seven minutes that tells you who we are as a comedian. Yeah, yeah. It's a good reminder, probably, to yeah. say, oh, you know, I probably need to be flexing that muscle from time to time yeah. to, to, you know, you never know, because... That's the sweet spot time. Well, a little bit longer for a TV spot. Right. So, right. Or, you know, late night show spot. Yeah. In the middle of all this, you wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And so writing is obviously something that you very much love to do. Yes. Um, what is your favorite thing about having written a book? That it's written. Like, um, <laughs> that it exists and I can be proud of it. Like, it's just nice that it's out there. I reference it too much. I tell people to read it too much or I'll be like I have you know instead of having to like explain an idea I can just be like well I wrote a chapter of my book about that but <laughs> those aren't true the thing that the thing that I love most about my book is that people read it people take the time to read it and like it's just so wonderful to have shared that much with people so that they you know, it's like when somebody tells me that they read my book, I know that they know me, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Like, uh, I was at a Purim carnival back in March, and I didn't grow up with a lot of, uh, like, you know, sort of institutional Judaism. There wasn't a synagogue in our town. We never really went to the synagogue in um, Sacramento. And it's, like, weird to most people. And, like, there was... A, I was talking to a girl, and I started to explain that to her. But she'd already told me that she read my book. And it was like, oh, well, you know. You know? <laughs> like, you understand who I am and where yeah. I'm from. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that so much. Yeah, yeah. How did you settle on the title, My Life as a Goddess? Um, I had this story that I would tell my friends when they were feeling down or defeated or whatever um, about uh, Leto, the the mother of Apollo and um, Artemis, and it was you know a story from when she was pregnant and like some peasants are mean to her and she gets really hurt and then she's like, oh shit, I'm a goddess and she turns them all into frogs. And um, I really wanted that to be the title. Uh, I wanted to use that as a framing device for the book and I, I forget what happened, but like the my editor wasn't into it and then he like came around on it and it made me so happy because um, like the, that idea and then the thing is, is like, that framing device actually helped me find what the last chapter would be. It's a uh, it's a different story about a different goddess, um, but it it really was, I think, when it comes to anything, being able to work from passions or things that mean a lot to you is like a great. It's such a strong place to start, mm-hmm. you know. And because this was a story that really meant a lot to me. Being able to start there would give strength to everything else I was writing. Yeah. Uh, my son, for many years, was a diehard Greek mythology uh-huh. junkie as well. Yes. So uh, I'm going to have to mention that you dropped a couple of mythological characters <laughs> in the middle of our interview. Yes. Because he will often correct me if I tr- even uh-huh. attempt to uh-huh. <laughs> reference uh-huh. characters. Yeah. <laughs> and now I, I will apologize. I've not read the book. I listened... To an audible clip. Oh. <laughs> so I but, the number, but I will add it to my list. The number of people who are like, I, they listened to my book on as an audiobook, and like, I think those people think of it as a more intimate experience because Sweet. I was reading it yeah. to them, you yeah. know? I, I have uh, I have a love-hate relationship with the, the audiobook, but if it is the author reading it, I can get behind that so much more. I like a nice non-fiction book on Audible. Mm-hmm. Like, I like a nice historical, like, just me learning dry facts. Oh, it makes me so happy. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, last summer, yeah, last summer, because we were still in the in the heyday of isolation to some extent, mm-hmm. I got to talk to Teddy Margus, mm-hmm. who also shared some time with Joan Rivers, and I asked yeah. him for one of his, you know, fabulous Joan stories. Uh, So may I ask you for one of your favorite stories? I'm going to give you two. Okay. Um, Maybe even three. Uh, So (laughs) I started at Fashion Police the week of the Golden Globes. And so the the head writer, Tony Tripoli, told me where to go. And I arrived. And I I assumed all of the writers were going to be there. But it was just... Joan, Melissa, Cooper, uh, Melissa's son, Tony the head writer, me and Jackie Beat. And there was so much deli there that I kept waiting for the other writers to come. And they were, do you want sandwiches? And I was like, well, well, we'll wait for everybody else. And there's like, there's nobody else. Um, So it like, it was a really amazing. And also for um, the award shows, we would go, so like just the six of us or whatever, watched the Golden Globes and we came up with ideas and then we went back to the E offices and the rest of the writers were there and we wrote all night long. For an award show we would write all night long and then Joan would get some sleep and she would show up at 4 a.m. I've seen Joan Rivers with no makeup, no spackle (laughs) connecting the plates. Um, And she was there and we pitched out jokes to her and she said which one she liked and she didn't and I had one that was like really dumb um it, like Leah Michelle was wearing a, a silver dress and it was just she looks like a filling 
Um, and Joan didn't pick that, and it didn't um, end up going in the list. But then when we were shooting that morning at like 11 a.m., Juliana Rancic said something that like teed her up. And like watching this 82, 83 year old woman like pull into her mind a joke that she had heard six hours before and like that wasn't on the teleprompter and just be able to deploy it in the perfect situation, it made me so impressed. It was one of those moments where I realized watching her and like when Betty White guested on Chelsea lately, realizing if you do something you love and, and really engages your mind and you are lucky enough to be healthy, like seeing people of that age still doing what they loved so well was really dazzling. Mm. And then the other good Joan story is just that every time... So Melissa Rivers' house was like in between Pacific Palisades and Malibu, up the coast, like it was gorgeous. And every time I would drive there on like a summer day, I would be like, I need to come early and then just go to the beach and then go to work. And I never did it. <laughs> um, but there was always the possibility while we were driving up the PCH to get to um, uh, Melissa's house that we would get a call and it would just be like, Joan and Melissa are fighting. And then there was this, this safe way, like the world's most glorious safe way, a safe way that hangs <laughs> over the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> And there would just be like 10 or 12 writers sitting there um, waiting for Joan and Melissa to come to an emotional place where we could come and do our jobs. But that was, it was such a wonderful job because around that same point in time, um, Anthony Jeselnik had the Jeselnik Offensive on Comedy Central. And uh, I was talking to one of the writers on it and it was, you know, mostly, it came from his work on roast and it was mostly roast jokes. And I asked if they had any female writers, and he was like, they couldn't find anyone. They couldn't find anyone. No, no one, they put out offers to these people, and they put out offers to people who were stand-ups, who were buzzy and successful, who didn't want that kind of job, and they were like, they couldn't find anyone. And I was just like, they're not looking in the right place. Because every week I go to people who are writing brutal roast jokes, who are pretty much all gay men and women, and Brian Cook. And... Um, <laughs> But we're doing a non-union job for five to six hundred dollars a week, and you're doing a union job for forty-five hundred dollars a week. But the people who do our, even though we're good at what we do, we're not being considered huh. for the jobs that you guys have. And it was just like a reminder of sort of the structural discrimination that can go on in this business. Yeah, that's heavy. Do you also think things have changed? It's since? also just the truth. I mean, the thing is, is that like everyone, just about everyone who was great from Fashion Police found really good jobs for yeah. themselves. Jackie Clark ran Keenan. Um, Eliz uh, Eliza Skinner uh, ran Drop the Mic. Brian Cook writes for Jimmy Kimmel now. Um, and things are better. But I also think the approach that has been taken to diversity has been a really structure like structural probably isn't the right word um it has been people wanting there to be more people of color in a room i don't and more women in a room and more queer people in a room but the way that we go about finding those people and positioning them i don't think is ha people haven't thought about how that system works yeah. you know people haven't thought about it but here i am you know like So I started on Chelsea Lately in 2007, and no stand-up manager would represent me until, or wanted to represent me until 2015. In like 20, in 2013, I went to somebody and I was like, "You should represent me. I make a lot of money. Let's do this." And she worked out okay, but it wasn't until 2015. Zach Freeman, my current manager, had seen me at Bridgetown, and he was like, "I want to represent that guy." But the thing is, is I now look and I see all of these queer comics with mainstream managers who are repped at places that were not interested in me for so much of my career. And I'm like, good, things have changed. But it also is really rough that for such a long time, like by 2015, I had been making good money for a while yeah. and on a regular basis 
And there were people I knew who were nice, attractive, straight white guys who had truly... Ne one of them admitted to me, he was like, I've made less than $1,000 off of stand-up. But he had really great reps because people understood where he could go. People didn't understand where I could go. And that's hard. Like, th that's a thing. And it's also, in my career, it's been an issue that I, in my own mind, need to remind myself where I can go and not have an excessively restricted idea of what's possible there. You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I... I mean, you have the powerhouse, your writing skills, you're very engaging, and, you know, I feel like you're going to, you can I do okay. That. Yeah, I think yes. so. I think so. Well, we're going to start wrapping down, uh, wrapping up. A uh, couple of questions that I want to hit on is, you are what they call a multi-hyphenate with a lot of, of skills um, in, your, in your toolkit. What do you want to be known as? Oh like Guy Branham that's the thing about <laughs> that's the thing about doing stand up is um, l like people will will say oh it's people who are broken or people who want therapy and Eliza Skinner once said like people who do stand up it's so frequently because you just want your voice to be heard your perspective to be heard mm -hmm. and the thing is is like I love that this job I've chosen lets me truly create things that use as much of me as is possible. Mm -hmm. Like Talk Show, the game show, the show that I had on uh, True TV, like truly took advantage of like 80% of what I do and it was so much fun. But then I got to leave that and go right for the Mindy Project, which was yeah. a completely different job, um, but was so much fun. Yeah. And like, I can continue to shape and form that. And I don't have to just be defined by one of these things I truly can if one thing doesn't work out you go do another thing yeah. like if one thing starts to get old you go do another thing and like also being able to pull those skills together you know um last fall I worked on bros this uh, Billy Eichner's rom-com that's coming out uh, September 30th everybody should go Yay. see it um but I was like in the cast, I was acting. That was fun and taking advantage of like muscles I don't get to exercise all the time. But then I was also um, the punch-up writer on set, helping like fix jokes and that stuff. I'm so used to it and it comes naturally. And the whole time, I'm getting to like watch and learn from this really great director. And you know, it it was something that was unlike jobs I had done before. After my first day, I 100% cried because. <laughs> I didn't understand what they wanted from me and what I was supposed to be doing. And by the end of it, I had fallen in love with everyone I was working with, and it was like, this is the best job I've ever had. That's beautiful. It was fun. A guy and Billy combo? Yes. That's going to be awesome. As an all-queer cast, it's very exciting. Ooh, very nice, very nice. Well, yes. I know you have a time time limit here, so we're, yes. I'm going to wrap us up. I do have uh, a closing question. Okay. One word to describe your future. Oh, that's wonderful, but it's just going to be florid again. Like, <laughs> whatever I do, success or failure, it's going to be flowery and fun. It's going to have lots of good times in it. And, like, I'll enjoy it, regardless of whether the universe decides to enjoy it back. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. All right, um, I know that you you do have to get somewhere. Um, I'm going to let you tell us about where to follow you and if there's a big project that you want to make sure people know about. You can follow me across all social media at Guy Branham, and please go see uh, Bros in theaters September 30th. Um, it's Billy Eichner's rom-com, and it's really funny. I'm excited it's, for that. Uh, from the directed and co-written by the guy who uh, directed Forgetting Sarah Marshall and Neighbors and Neighbors 2, and executive produced by, uh, by Judd Apatow. So, like, it's a comedy of the sort that we love. That's amazing. That is so yeah. amazing. Congratulations on Thanks. that. All right. Well, that is a wrap on Comedy Wham Presents Guy Branham. We hope you've enjoyed learning about how Guy got to be the comedic genius that you heard today just as much as I have. Uh, I'm Valerie, and that's been funny. Thank you so much, Guy. Thanks so much for having me.